Well, it's late May here in southern Japan, and uh, you can see these orchids around me are just flowering like mad. There's this lovely Fukuren flowered form of Bletula striata, a blue cast form of Bletula striata over here. This is uh, Soju. Not Soju. Oh, Soju, yeah. <laughs> um, we also have Dendrobiums. We have a Dendrobium minelliformi. We have a Dendrobium minelliformi hybrid back here, and this lovely. Uh, Vietnamese dendrobium, uh, dendrobium trontoani, uh, in full flower, as well as this lovely white flowered form of Phaeus flavus, which is a uh, native Japanese orchid. Well, today we're going to be following step by step how to pollinate an orchid flower, uh, starting with uh, orchid flower structure, which you need to know before you start trying to pollinate these. And in a few weeks, uh, so actually we'll be trying to pollinate some of these actual flowers. And in a few weeks, I'll do a follow-up on the uh, seed pod formation. And with any luck, we'll actually get some of these to take. Okay, before we start pollinating any flowers, I wanted to show you this great book that a uh, plantsman friend of mine gave me. His name is uh, Rogier van Vogt. He's a uh, Dutch plantsman, and this book is actually written in Dutch. It's Wild Orchids. What I want to show you about this book is uh, all these great color plates and uh, all this wonderful information about these plants, unfortunately all in Dutch. But uh, in here there also is a page on uh, orchid flower structure and I wanted to show you that so we could uh, talk about uh, how uh, orchids flower is structured before you actually try to uh, pollinate them because they have very specific structure and you need to know what to look for uh, before you start pollinating. So here's the page I was talking about. So. I'm going to go ahead and bring this up closer so you can see it. Orchid flowers in general have three petal-like parts called sepals that are commonly held in a triangular pattern. There also are two petals which are often larger or more ornate than the sepals and are usually held to the sides horizontally. The third petal is specialized and known as the lip or labellum. It is positioned centrally and projects out a bit. It is different in form from the sepals and petals, usually being larger or longer and often frilled. All the flower parts attach to the ovary at the back of the flower, which contains the ovules that become seeds after pollination has occurred. The ovary itself fattens and elongates to form the seed pod or capsule. Also notice the small projection at the base of the flower. This is the nectary, commonly called the spur in orchid flowers. Variation in form can be extreme with orchid flowers, so this is just the general scheme. In most flowers, the male and female sexual parts are separated into the stamens and pistil, respectively. However, in orchids, both male and female parts are fused into one structure, known as the column. It is usually cradled by the base of the lip, as in this phaeus flower. To get a better look, I'm going to remove the lip entirely. The column is usually an elongate structure as in this flower. At the tip is a bulbous structure called the anther cap, protecting the pollinia underneath. At the base of the anther cap is a sticky pad called the visidium. When this is contacted, it sticks like glue to whatever touches it, as in the case of this toothpick. The visidium is connected to the pollinia, which are waxy masses of pollen grains and are usually yellow or orange in color. Just to the rear where the visidium was attached, on the underside of the column, is the stigmatic surface. This is where we want to put the pollinia to successfully pollinate the flower. The next thing to do is to attach the pollinia to the underside of the column by rubbing or pushing them onto that surface. It takes quite a bit of effort to get the pollinia to stay put, as in this flower, so do whatever it takes to get them to stick. I know it looks like an inexact science, and it is, but if you get close enough, you will eventually succeed. Here I am trying to pollinate the Phaeus and Bletula flowers, a bit of a comedy act.
The Dendrobium trontuani proves to be a lot easier. The polynia in this species are tiny, but they stick very easily to the stigmatic surface. Usually just one push and you're done. Well, it's mid-August, three months later, and you can see that this Dendrobium trontulani has formed two very nice seed pods. And uh, let's see what else we got here. Oh yeah, the Phaeus flavus as well has also formed two nice pods. Let's allow a little bit less than I had hoped. There's a couple good ones. The Dendrobium nulliformi has uh, one, two, three, four. I've got lots of those plants around, so I have a lot of seed pods of that, actually. And this uh, little plant that you didn't see. Uh, this is Cymbidium gerengi, which is another uh, native Japanese uh, orchid. You can see that its pod is standing straight up. Uh, the flower does not present itself that way. It normally is it's bent over like that, but once it uh, pollinates, the seed pod will grow straight up. Uh, some orchids do that. This species uh, takes about a year for the pod to mature, so you have to be patient with this one, um, which is another topic about uh, seed pod formation. We'll talk a little bit about that at the end of the video. When the pods are ripe, they'll start to split along these seams, a process called dehiscence. If left alone, the seeds within the pod will disperse in the wind naturally since they are very tiny. The exact time of ripening depends on the species, but can be as little as a couple months and up to a year. Check out the list at the end of the video for some general guidelines for different orchid genera. I hope this video helps you understand orchid flowers a little bit better. Now you can try your own hand at pollinating orchids yourself.